Turn with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 2. The book of Acts, chapter 2. We're looking at Jerusalem, the dwelling place of God. Can we bring up the first frame, please? Thank you. Acts chapter 2, verses 1 to 5. And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as a fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues, and the Spirit was given them utterance. Now, there were living in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. That term, therefore, living, is actually the term dwelling, dwelling, katoikia, katoikia from the word oikio, meaning house or permanent place of dwelling. This was Hag Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks, one of the three pilgrim feasts when Jews would have to congregate from everywhere. We continue reading in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 27. For truly in this city they were gathered together against thy holy servant Jesus, Yeshua, whom thou didst anoint, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel. Notice that the actual crucifixion of Jesus was carried out by Pontius Pilate in the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. The early Christians and the Apostles assigned legal responsibility for the crucifixion of Jesus to the Roman government. But St. Peter makes it very clear that it was not simply the Jews, it was the Romans together with them. Um, of course, God ultimately takes responsibility for the death of Jesus. Jesus said, I lay my life down. No one takes it from me. But anti-Semites have always liked to take these texts out of context to justify their hatred of Jews as Christ killers. Of course, that's not what the New Testament teaches, but that's what they say. Nonetheless, these things were in Jerusalem. Well, what's happening in Jerusalem? We read what was happening in Jerusalem in the book of Acts. They were meeting in Acts chapter 2, but where were they meeting? They were meeting in Solomon's portico. That's where they were meeting. In Acts chapter 2, we read that they were meeting house to house and in the temple. They were meeting house to house and in the temple. Can we get the next frame, please? The area of the temple where they would have met... Thank you. Thank you, Rick. It was here, Solomon's portico, on the southern side of the Temple Mount, Solomon's portico. That's where rabbis met with their disciples and where the rabbis would frequently debate each other. I'm sorry, here, Solomon's portico on the south side. Solomon's portico, that would have been it. That would have been the area where the early church would have met. It's where Jesus would have spent most of his time with his apostles. Immediately proceeding north from Solomon's portico was the court of the Gentiles. The court of the Gentiles. And that barrier there, separating the court of the Gentiles from the main portion of the temple, is called the Mechitzat, the Mechitzat, the wall of partition. It has been excavated, two pillars inscribed in Greek, warning Gentiles to go no further, written in Greek and in Aramaic. So this was the Solomon's portico where the church was meeting. The Apostle James would have been thrown, by tradition according to Eusebius, off of that tower down into the Ophel. Where I'm pointing here would be the Kidron Valley. That is the area where the church would be meeting. This is the court of the Gentiles. God-fearing Gentiles, monotheistic non-Jews who believed in the God of Israel but who had not gone, undergone circumcision and conversion to Judaism could go this far for purposes of worship but no further. Jews could cross the Mechitzat, but then you had the temple itself. This area was where only the clergy could go, where only the clergy could go to bring the sacrifices. 
Here is the court of the women. The court of the women. Jewish women could go here. Men could go. This would have been the Nakaner Gate. Sometimes it's believed to be the beautiful gate. There's a dispute with archaeologists. Women could go here. Men could go further to the next chamber. But only the priests could go here. And once a year, the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies, the place where God dwelt on the Day of Atonement on Yom Kippur. Once a year, the Aaronic high priest would go in. So Gentiles could go here, Jews could go here, Jewish women could go here, Jew Jewish women could go here, Jewish men could go this far, but here, only the clergy, the Levitical priesthood, and then here, only the high priest himself could enter the Kodesh Kodeshim in the Holy of Holies and go before the Lord's presence. The ark was not in the second temple, it was only in the first. But that is Jerusalem where God dwelt, where God dwelt. Now let's understand this idea again of dwelling. There are two words for dwelling. One again is koitekia, but we're told that Jews also dwelt there, not just God. The understanding of this was, sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come. I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord our God. God would dwell where his people would dwell. This was particularly important at the convocations of the three high holidays, which were the, pil the pilgrim feasts, Passover, the Feast of Weeks, which was this one, and also the Feast of Tabernacles later in the year in the autumn time. But now let's look at the other word, John chapter 1, verse 14. John 1, 14, the word became flesh. The Logos became Sodex and dwelt among us. The Logos became Sarx and dwelt among us. Can we go back to the previous frame, please? Koitokia dwelling, John 1.14, kataskeno, kataskeno. The word became flesh and kataskeno, dwelt among us from the Hebrew word shekinah. It was a Greekization of shekinah, shekinah, shekinah. What it's saying is, the same God who dwelt in the Shekinah, the Ruach Kodesh of the Old Testament, would now become incarnate in the person of Jesus. The Logos would become Sarx. The Word would become flesh and dwell among us. Shekinah among us. Literally, tabernacle among us. Now, there's a good translations of the Scripture and there's bad translations. The word became flesh and dwelt among us, that's valid. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us is more accurate. But if you have a copy of a forgery claiming to be the word of God called uh, the message, do yourself a favor and put a match to it. <laughs> the word became flesh and moved into our neighborhood. That's what it says. A Jehovah's Witness would not have the audacity to take that kind of liberty with the Word of God. Amen. It bears absolutely no resemblance whatsoever to what the original Greek says or the underlying Hebrew or Aramaic thought. None. It is a complete imposter. It's absolutely absurd, yet that is the purpose-driven Bible. If you believe the purpose-driven lie, you have to have a Bible that tells lies. That's not what it says. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. This, of course is the meaning. Next frame, please. Next one. We have different words for the dwelling place of God, where he would meet with man. Different words in Greek and Hebrew. I'll begin with the Hebrew. Ohel, Ohel, tent, the tent of meeting. The tent of meeting preceded the temple, and it was mobile. It was dynamic. It was not stationary. It was designed for mobility to transport the Holy Ark. The closest it ever came to a permanent home was not actually in Jerusalem initially, but was in Shiloh, Shiloh, which in Genesis 49 was a metaphor for the Messiah. The scepter will not depart from Judah until Shiloh comes. That was the tent. That was the tent of meeting Oi. The second term is Mishkan. Mishkan, again, coming from Shekinah, the place of dwelling. Mishkan from Shekinah. The third is Bet Migdash. Bet Migdash. 
It was an architectural description of the temple, the house of the tower. The fourth is a general term for temple in Hebrew, hakal, or in Hebrew with the article, hahakal, temple. Those are the main four Greek uh, Hebrew words. The New Testament gives us three terms. Oikos or oikos hegios, holy dwelling or holy house, is one term used for the temple in the New Testament. Second is the basic Greek word for temple, heron. Heron, where we get the word priest. The word priest comes from temple. I once watched a uh, Roman Catholic Franciscan on the Catholic Channel talking about priests and where it says priests in the New Testament. Well, in fact, the word he was calling priest was not the word priest. It was the word presbyter. In the New Testament, there's no such thing as a priesthood except the priesthood of all believers. We're all priests in the New Testament. There's no such teaching as a separate priesthood. He had to give it a completely different word than the New Testament does. Now, notice something. What the Roman church does, what the Mormons do, as David described, often what the rabbis do in the Talmudic literature, and certainly what the purpose-driven people do. They have to change the word of God. Otherwise, they cannot theologically or doctrinally substantiate what they're doing and what they're teaching. They cannot let the scripture stand on its own merit. Heron, temple, naos, is a holy site, or sometimes in the Greek, in the classic literature, called the shrine. Those are the main terms. The ohel was ultimately brought by King David to Jerusalem. These are the words for the place where God dwelt in Jerusalem. Four in the Old Testament, three in the New. Those are the primary ones. Next frame, please. Let's understand something. Seven times, seven times the New Testament says the church, the body of Christ corporately is the temple. Seven times. The first place refers to the Ohel. When the Gentile church begins to grow and they have the first church council in the book of Acts chapter 15, verse 16. Turn with me, please, to Acts 15, 16. Now notice here, verse 13, first of all, James, Yaakov, Jacob answered, saying, Brethren, listen to me. If Peter was the first pope, why was James presiding instead of Peter? Why isn't James saying, listen to the Pope, listen to Peter? He says, listen to me. Why is James presiding? James was the primus inter paris, the first among equals, not Peter at this particular time. Simeon, who is Peter, has related how God first concerned himself about taking from among the Gentiles a people for his name. And with these words, the words of the prophets agree, just as it is written. Quoting from Amos, after these things, I will return and I will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen, and I will rebuild its ruins. Now, David never actually built a stone tabernacle. He had a tent. The word here in Greek is a word for tent. This is the tabernacle of David. Notice what the apostles say. The restoration of the tabernacle of David is fulfilled in the church. The second temple is Solomon's temple, the temple of Shlomo HaMelech. The third is the temple of Zerubbabel, built in the days of Haggai, Ezra, and Nehemiah after the Babylonian captivity. But this is expanded by Herod the Great and becomes called Herod's temple. Herod was of Nabataean descent, ethnically. He was not an ethnic Jew. He was of Nabataean descent, similar to Moabites and, and Edomites. They were people who lived in, in Jordan who were converted to Judaism in the Hasmonean period after the Maccabees. He was a Jew by religion of political convenience. Ethnically, he was a Nabataean. Culturally, he was a Roman. To impress the Romans, he built a retaining wall on the north, south, east, west of the Temple Mount. He built this retaining wall. Over here where I'm pointing is the Wailing Wall. It's the last bit leave, still standing, the Western Retaining Wall. He built a wall around the mount, filled it in, and expanded it. 
It's to this very day the largest man-made plateau in the world. That is it. But using Ezekiel's vision of the millennial temple, using Ezekiel's vision of the millennial temple as a blueprint and combining that with Greco-Roman classic architecture, he expands Zerubbabel's temple, taking over 30 years. So the Zerubbabel's temple and Herod's temple are the same structure, but Herod's temple is the expansion of Zerubbabel's, enhanced by Greco-Roman architecture and using Ezekiel's vision. Herod tried to bring about a kind of a millennial consciousness of, of that, that the nation would reach its, the promises of God for reaching its apex as a nation and a people under, under his domain. He was trying to impress the Jews religiously, but he was trying to impress the Romans architecturally. That is his temple. But then in John chapter 2, verse 19, Jesus spoke of the temple as his body. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Jesus spoke of his body as the temple. However, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, Paul the Apostle tells us that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. And in the context he's writing to a very promiscuous city like Corinth, he's saying sexual sin, adultery, fornication, things like that, the cult prostitution that was going on with the Hieros Gamos in Corinth, you're defiling God's temple. Well, if somebody is sleeping with somebody other than their husband or their wife, they're defiling God's temple. That is the teaching of the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16. So Jesus' body is a temple, but then we become temples of the Holy Spirit. It works like this. The temple is always a box, a box in a box in a box. It's a box in a box in a box. The outer court corresponding to the court of the Gentiles that everybody could see is the body. In Greek, soma. In Hebrew, goof. Everybody could see someone's physical body. Okay. The holy place here is the soul. In Greek, psuche. In Hebrew, nephesh. Nephesh. It's what in English we'd call anomanopia. God breathed on Adam. He became a living soul. It sounds, the word sounds like, gets its name from what it sounds like. Nephesh, respiration. <sighs> nephesh. <sighs> That's the soul, is the nephesh. The third is the spirit. In Greek, pneuma as in pneumonia or pneumatic drill, in Hebrew, ruach. We are tripartite beings. We have a body, a soul, and a spirit. We are not bipartite. We do not simply have a body and a soul, as Darwinism teaches, as Freudian psychology teaches. Jungian psychology does acknowledge a spiritual dimension of man, but it, it's an occult misinterpretation of it, the collective unconscious. Eastern religion and secular psychology confuse the soul with the spirit. The soul is as distinct from the spirit as the body is from the soul. Someone's emotions or intellect are not their eyelashes. Well, either is somebody's spirit, their emotions, or their mind. The two become easily confused because it's a box in a box in a box. I just feel so close to God. That's what they argue. I saw people in Pensacola, Florida, more recently Lakeland, Florida, that tattooed guy was kicking all ladies in the face. I know it was God. I felt blessed. Somehow their feeling becomes the barometer of spirituality. This is something denounced in Galatians as sensuality. We're told in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, separating bone from marrow as soul from spirit. We're told we must use the word of God to distinguish what is our own feelings, our own emotions, our own thoughts, and truly the revelation of the Holy Spirit. It's so easy. Is that a real tongue or is it gibberish? Is that a real prophecy or is it clairvoyance? Is that a real word of knowledge or is it your own mind? We are commanded to judge such things by the word of God. Now it's interesting, in Hebrews, the word there 
commanding us to judge is kritikos. Kritikos. We get the word critical. It doesn't mean critical in the sense of fault finding, but it means critical in the sense of judging something objectively. Yet when you do this, when you do what Scripture commands, the people who are caught up in this nonsense will tell you, you have a critical spirit. Well, I certainly hope so. We're commanded to have a critical spirit. If you don't have a critical spirit, there's something wrong with you. You're going to be deceived. In fact, if you don't have a critical spirit, you're deceived already. The outer court is not the same as the inner court. The inner court's not the same as the holy of holies. The mind is not the same as the spirit. The body's not the same as the mind. God breathed on Adam. He became a living soul. In other words, mental illness never originates in the mind. Whatever people are psychologically is a combination of what they are organically, physiologically, and what they are spiritually. <laughs> mental illness either originates in the body, there's something chemically wrong with that person organically, hypothyroidism or something that's causing behavioral abnormality, or there's something wrong with them spiritually, or a combination of the two. Mental illness never originates in the mind. Unfortunately, psychiatric medicine has to a very large degree been corrupted by psychology. Psychology is pseudoscience. It has no quantitative basis. It is a false theology of man. That's all it is. It is not real science. It is non-quantitative. Now, there is biblical psychology. Biblical psychology is the book of Proverbs. It understands we're three-dimensional. It understands the relationship between behavior and what we are spiritually, fallen people who need to be saved. Well, I only mention this in passing because that's what the temple means. Our bodies are temple. We are temples of the Holy Spirit. Now, it's quite a thing. That same Shekinah who dwelt in the Holy Ark, that same Shekinah who was in Solomon's temple, that same Shekinah now dwells in us. <laughs> How should we live if we are indeed temples of the Holy Spirit. And if we sin or drop our crosses as believers, we grieve the Holy Spirit. Then the church, the body of Christ, is called the temple. Look with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 14, and verses 20 to 22. The book of Ephesians. Chapter 2, verse 14 he himself is our peace who made both groups, that is Jew and Gentile, into one, who broke down the barrier, the dividing wall. That's the Mechitzat. But now let's look at verse 20. Having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ himself being the cornerstone, the Rosh Pina in Hebrew, in whom the whole building being fitted together is growing into a holy temple to the Lord in whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. What existed in Jerusalem, the church is to be a temple. It's the body of Christ. It says the same thing in 1 Peter 2.5. We'll look at that in a moment. Seventh, we have the tribulational temple. The tribulational temple of Revelation chapter 11, verse 2. We read about it in Revelation 11, 2. Revelation 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, Matthew 24, 15, and Daniel should be chapter 11, verse 31. Daniel 11, 31. The abomination of desolations, the shikutz hameshomem, an Aramaic term, will be set up in the holy place where it should not be. Now, some people have tried to say, well, Antiochus Epiphanes did that 160 years before Christ. He did. But you cannot say it has no future meaning because in Matthew 24, 15, Jesus said what Antiochus did has to happen again. The Antichrist is, is, going to, is foreshadowed by Antiochus. Antiochus did it. That's true. And Jesus knew he did it. Jesus celebrated Hanukkah in John chapter 10. Jesus knew what Antiochus did, but he said it had to happen again. There must be a tribulational temple, and there are people today wanting to build it. There are two yeshivas in Jerusalem dedicated to resurrecting the Levitical priesthood. You can go to the Temple Institute. By some accounts, they have approximately 70% 
of the articles required to reestablish Levitical sacrifices. And there have been experiments with um, mitochondrial DNA. They have a list of 252 Jews, some of them in Israel, most of them not in Israel, who they can put into a same Levitical family simply using mitochondrial DNA signatures. These people are serious. They're using biogenetic engineering to try to resurrect the Levitical priesthood. That would not have been possible even a generation ago. You, you couldn't identify a tribe uh, positively. Of course, mitochondrial DNA also debunks the Book of Mormon. Finally, there'll be a millennial temple. We read this in Ezekiel chapter 40, verse 5 to 47, 1. These are the seven major temples not inclusive of the millennial temple. These are the seven. Next frame, please. So we begin to understand then, Jerusalem, where God dwelt, is to be a picture of the church. To be a picture of the church. Look with me, please, to the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 21. Verse 20, referring to the events that would come in 70 AD, but when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, then recognize her destruction is at hand. Let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains, and let those who are in the midst of the city depart, and let not those who are in the country enter the city. Okay. So in Acts chapter 2, in the temple grounds, we have the early church meeting. The apostles are their pastors. Everything seems to be going well, except they knew the city was under a death sentence. When I was first saved in the Jesus movement, I was saved through a cult called the Children of God, and then I was in another cult called uh, Forever Family. These people wanted to go back radically to the book of Acts and be like the early Christians. And in many respects, they succeeded up to a point. They were extremely zealous evangelistically and so forth, and they put their money where their mouth is. But they tried to take certain instances and make it a template, a norm for everybody. Everybody should live communally like the apostles did in Jerusalem. There were other places where people did not live that way. Everybody should just pack up and follow. Quit college, quit university. Just, they were saying things like this. Well, Jesus told the demoniac again, Serene, to stay where you are. He told the woman he wanted to follow. Jesus, don't stay where you are. Or he told the woman at Samaria, stay where you are. Because it's God's will for one person and one group of people to do something in one instance, you cannot assume it's God's will for everybody everywhere, but people love to take one verse, one text out of context and make it a pretext for their own agenda, usually to build their own empires. Now, I'm not saying this in tribute to Chuck Smith. I'm just stating a fact. Chuck Smith being one person, Marsh Rosen of Jews for Jesus being another, they took the stability of the established churches and combined it with the zeal of the Jesus freaks and made something, or God made something, that was good. The churches that kicked out the hippies basically died a self-inflicted death, the death of Laodicea. <laughs> they declined. Okay. The churches that welcomed the hippies in grew. On the other hand, the Jesus freaks, who remained in isolation from the rest of the body of Christ, tended to become cults. I know at least a half dozen that have become cults. Personally, I know a half dozen. On the other hand, the ones who combined with their brethren tended to become something good. The established church needed the hippies, the hippies needed the established church. Chuck Smith understood that. Others understood that. But unfortunately, there were many others who did not understand it. And a lot of people were hurt. Marriages were destroyed. All kinds of terrible things happened with some of these groups. So you had a situation now where they're all in Jerusalem and they begin selling their goods and giving the money. To, well, if Jesus himself told you that Tempe, Arizona was going to be bulldozed, was going to be leveled by a natural disaster, or was going to be invaded from Mexico or something, the place was going to get wiped out, get ready to leave town, wouldn't you put your house on the market? <laughs> <laughs> the 
there were practical circumstances why they did what they did. They knew the place was doomed. They knew they were going to have to flee. The danger was they began to get comfortable. That is one of the reasons the Lord allowed the martyrdom of Stephen. So they realized, don't get stuck to literal geographical Jerusalem, even though it has a prophetic purpose. God's purposes would go beyond that. Now let's understand this. Look with me, please, to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 22 again. In whom you also are being built together into a dwelling of a holy of God in the spirit, a spiritual temple. The whole building being fit together into a holy temple. We're built upon a foundation of the apostles. Jesus has the Rosh Pina, the cornerstone. Notice the physical components of the temple correspond to different kinds of believers. Look with me, please, to Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. Revelation 3, 14. We have the message to the last church, the church of Laodicea, the lukewarm church, the church that is self-deluded. But Jesus tells something else to the church of Philadelphia, the church that precedes this church. He tells the faithful believers in this church that he will make them a pillar <coughs> in the temple of his God, that he will make them a pillar in the temple of his God. Believers will become pillars, at least the ones who are not caught up in the spirit of Laodicea. Look with me, please, also to Galatians, the book of Galatians, chapter 2, verse 9. And recognizing the grace that had been given to me, James and Cephas, that's Peter, and Aramaic, and John, who were reputed to be pillars. Reputed to be pillars. Physical structures of the temple corresponded to apostles. There were two pillars in the temple. The first was called Yakin, Yakin, Yahweh shall establish. And the second pillar was called Boaz, in his strength. The Lord would establish his temple in his strength. The apostles' teaching. Does the apostolic authority still exist in the church in the sense of Peter, James, and John? Yes, in the writings of the apostles. In the doctrine they defined, they were inspired by the Holy Spirit to write the New Testament. That's apostolic authority in the original sense. But now let's look further at this. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, please. You also, as living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house for a holy priesthood. Notice Christians are called the stones of the temple. We are called the stones of the temple. We're the stones. The physical components of the temple correspond to different Christians. Now let's understand this in light of the Old Testament. Everything in the Old Testament is a shadow of the new fulfilled in Christ. The whole thing is a shadow to teach about the new covenant relationship in Jesus. Building the temple. Look at 1 Corinthians I'm sorry, 1 uh, Chronicles, chapter 29, verses 6 to 9. 
and the rulers of the father's household and the commanders of the thousands and of the hundreds with the overseers over the king's work offered willingly. And for the service for the house of God, they gave 5,000 talents and 10,000 darics of gold and 10,000 talents of silver and 18,000 talents of brass and 100,000 talents of iron. Whoever possessed precious stones gave them to the treasury of the house of the Lord in care of Jael, the Gershonite. Then the people rejoiced because they had offered so willingly, for they made their offering to the Lord with a whole heart. And King David also rejoiced greatly. The natural blessings we have from the Lord materially, financially, as well as intellectually. God gave us these things to build his temple. Before somebody is saved, before they're born again, they're using these things for the world. They're using these things for a fallen empire. They're using these things for something that's in the power of the wicked one. When somebody is saved, not only is their soul saved, not only is their spirit saved, but even what they are physically becomes reconsecrated to God's service. Your profession, your money, your education. God gave these things for purposes of stewardship to build his son's body. Well, the person we have orphanages in Africa for AIDS babies, that's what we do. Uh, and it's run by a microbiologist uh, from England, wonderful guy, Dave Royal. Uh, and he lives about 300 feet from the most destitute poverty you can imagine. Uh, terrible. He'd been a lay pastor of a church in Manchester, England, and he worked for the American company Procter & Gamble as a senior microbiologist. Why would he take his professional background and go take care of AIDS-infected babies, orphans with HIV? We have medical people who do things like that. Well, I'm not saying it's God's will for every medic to go to the third world and take care of AIDS babies. But every Christian should be willing to do it if that's what God calls you to do. God might tell somebody else to stay in Chicago and make a mint, make a lot of money. There's a gift of philanthropy in the book of Romans chapter 12, that he who gives, gives with liberality. It's the Lord your God, Deuteronomy 8, who shows you how to make wealth, that he may establish the covenant. Somebody's got to finance missions and evangelism. Somebody's got to pay for this. Well, why does God show people how to make wealth? He sends one person to the mission field, but he raises another person up as a Christian businessman or professional person to finance it. I can't say what God wants you to do. I don't know what gifts he's given you, what education, what talent, what background. What I do know is if you're a Christian, he gave it to you to build his temple. Lord, what do you want me to do with this money, this education, this whatever? John Wesley was right. If he tells you to stay here and make money, John Wesley said, make all you can so you can give all you can. <laughs> Wesley was right. If God tells you to pack it up like the rich young ruler and go up to the third world and be a missionary, do that. It doesn't matter. The same as Jerusalem was under a sentence of death in 70 AD. The apostles were only waiting to flee. The early Christians were waiting to get out of there before judgment came. That should be our attitude to this world. The judgment of God is coming. The day of the Lord draweth nigh. What's the difference? Just do whatever he tells you to do, but realize we're getting out of here. That should be the mindset. That was the mindset of the early church in Jerusalem. They gave what they had to God's service to build his house. Now let's look at 2 Chronicles chapter 2. You can also read it in Kings, but for the sake of brevity, we'll stay in Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 2, verse 8, please.
He's going to build a house for the Lord. Send me also cedar, cypress, and algum, timber from Lebanon. For I know that your servants know how to cut timber of Lebanon, and indeed my servants will work with your servants to prepare timber in abundance for me, for the house which I am about to build will be great and wonderful. Now behold, I'll give your servants, the woodsmen who cut the timber, 20,000 cores of crushed wheat, 20,000 cores of barley, and 20,000 baths of wine, and 20,000 baths of oil. Then Huram, or Hiram, the king of Tyre, answered in a letter to Solomon, saying, Because the Lord loves his people, he's made you king over them. Then Hiram continued, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, who's made heaven and earth, who has given King David a wise son, endowed with discretion and understanding, who will build a house for the Lord and a royal palace for himself. In verses 17 and 18 of that same chapter in 2 Chronicles 2. And Solomon numbered all the aliens who were in the land of Israel, following the census which his father David had taken, and 153,600 were found. And that number, 153, has to do with the number of the elect always in some context. It's been tabulated that Jesus personally blessed 153 people in the Gospels. That's how many fish were left. It's also an interesting number mathematically as a triangular number, but that's another issue. Let's look. And he appointed 70,000 of them to carry loads and 80,000 to quarry stones in the mountains and 3,600 supervisors to make the people work. Notice there was peace between Jew and Gentile. The non-Jew recognized the Jew had the true God. The Jew had the grain. The Jew had the blueprint. But the Gentiles had the resources and the manpower. Nobody can cut the trees like the Sidonians, like the Gentiles. Look with me, please, to 1 Kings chapter 5. Verse 10 to 12. So Hiram gave Solomon as much as he desired of cedar and cypress and timber. Solomon then gave Hiram the wheat, etc. We read verses 17 and 18. Then the king commanded, and they quarried great stones, costly stones, to lay the foundation of the house with cut stones. So Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders and the Gebelites cut them and prepared the timbers and the stones to build the house. Jew and Gentile working together to build God's temple. That's the Old Testament. Peace between Jew and Gentile, worshiping the same God, the God of Israel, the Jews providing the grain, the oil, the blueprint. The Gentiles providing the numbers, the muscle, the manpower, and the experience. This was to be the church. He is our peace. We shall be one. He is our reconciliation. The wall of partition, he's broken down. He is our peace. We shall be one. Ephesians 2. Jew and Gentile becoming one in the worship of the true God, in the service of the true God. Now, most of the temple was made of trees. The Jews were the foundations. They were the apostles, it says in Ephesians. You had to have a foundation, and that foundation is Israel. If you see a building, the foundation may not be visible, but you know there is one. Because if there was no foundation, the building couldn't stand. If God's finished with the Jews, he's automatically finished with the church. The foundation is there. But it was trees, these cedars of Lebanon. What does the scripture say? We shall be trees of righteousness. Good trees bear good fruit. The trees of the field will clap their hands. Jesus heals the blind man. I see them walking as trees will be the trees of righteousness. Remember, the physical components of the temple correspond to different believers. The living stones of 1 Peter 5, the pillars of Galatians chapter 1 and 2, the trees. Cut down those trees! 
Bring them into God's temple. It's a temple not made with human hands. The Old Testament is the shadow. What happened in Jerusalem was the shadow. If we don't understand why God dwelt in Jerusalem, we will not understand his plan for the church. The Jews provide the grain. Every writer of the New Testament was a Jew except Luke who converted to Judaism. It's a Jewish book, both Old and New Testament. Both covenants belong to Israel and the Jews. Romans chapter 9, verse 4. To them belongs, in Greek, present continuous active, the covenants, both covenants, diatheke, plural in Greek. We got the blueprint. We know how to build it. We got the grain. We'll give you the word of God. Why the Filipinos believe in the God of Israel? Why do people in Brazil believe in the God of Israel? Why do people in Korea worship the God of Israel? Who gave them that grain? There's oil and grain in Zion. We've got the oil. We've got the Holy Spirit. Let's go up to Zion. Na Aleziona, na Aleziona, na Aleziona, Kiriat Melek Rav. Shir hallelujah, shir hallelujah. You don't know how difficult it is to preach following David Hawking. <laughs> unless you tried to sing following Jonathan Seppel. <laughs> They've got the grain. Those Jews have the blueprint. They've got the vision. They've got the sun. God has given them the sun. But the Gentiles, <laughs> they got the numbers. They've got the merchandise and the muscle. They've got the know-how. We build together. The wall of partition is broken down. I'm ashamed to say too much of the modern messianic movement has been taken over by an extreme axis that are not only putting Gentiles under the law, they're virtually out to rebuild the wall of partition that Yeshua died to break down. Now, I detest replacement theology. It's a false doctrine. But this hyper-messianic extremism, they're basically behaving like Seventh-day Adventists with yarmulkes. People trying to live under two covenants. It's not supposed to be like that. It's supposed to be like this. <laughs> it's supposed to be like this. Well, let's go further. Can we go to the next frame, please? Everything was separated. The Gentiles, here, don't cross the Mechitzat, don't cross the wall of partition. Women, don't go any further, ladies. Gentlemen, stop right here. Only the priest can go up by that altar. Only once a year, the high priest can go all the way in. And so, going back to Acts 2, when they're meeting here, they know the place is doomed but they're not so worried about it. They knew the temple was going to be destroyed. The second temple was destroyed the same day as the first temple, to Shabbat, roughly the 9th of August, with this Megillah Echa, the, saw, the uh, Book of Lamentations is read ritually to this day. They knew it was doomed. Jesus told them, Daniel told them, the Messiah would have to come and die before the second temple would be destroyed. I once had a debate with the rabbi in New York, right in the street, on the upper west side of Manhattan, and it was in Hebrew, and he was really upset with me. And I said, well, you, you said Daniel was a prophet, and this is what it says. Is that not what it says? And he said, give me a better source than Daniel. I said, you want a better source than the word of God? If there was a better source than the word of God, he wouldn't be God. Unbelievable. The blindness of the Jewish people is unbelievable, and the blindness of the church is no less, no less unbelievable. When my wife was Israeli, she, she's the daughter of Holocaust survivors, when she was first saved, she witnessed to a Jew named uh, Shlomo. And Shlomo prayed with my wife to get saved at Hebrew University. All she had to do was basically show Shlomo from the Old Testament, the Tanakh, that Jesus was the Messiah, that he fulfilled the prophecies, and then she explained the gospel, and he got saved. Then she met some 
Arab Christian girls from the Greek Orthodox Church who are also students. And she said, but he's the Messiah. Oh, we know. Oh, but, 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 but he rose from the dead. Oh, we know. Now, my wife was astounded when she first got saved. Don't the rabbis know this? Don't the rabbis know this? She was astounded how the rabbis could not see the truth of the scriptures. That was a, something of a shock to her. But not nearly as much as a shock as when she saw people who claimed to be Christians, who believed these things were true, but were not born again. How can you believe he's rose from the dead and not be saved? Nominal Christianity is almost unfathomable to a Jewish believer. 99% of the Jews who you see believe in Jesus are born again. It's a, probably, I think, I think probably only 1% of the Jews I met who profess to be Christian would be nominal Christian. You get the occasional one who did it for business reasons, like Harry Oppenheimer or Robert Moses in New York. There's people who did it for political reasons and things like that, possibly. But 99% of the Jews you meet who believe in Jesus would be biblically evangelical. There'd be very few nominal Jewish believers. There's some wacky ones, but very few nominal ones. <laughs> Let's understand this. Separation. The wall of partition separated Jew from Gentile, but this whole thing was going to get knocked down. Think of a hospital or a school or a library. It's dilapidated. It's been condemned. It has to be torn down. I'm from New York. They're tearing down Yankee Stadium. I didn't agree with it, but they're tearing it down. But right next to it, they're building a new Yankee Stadium that even looks like it. <laughs> Who worries about the old Yankee Stadium if they're building a new Yankee Stadium next to the old Yankee Stadium? Well, the early Christians were the same. Why worry about this temple when God's building a new one? Only the new one's going to be better. Ephesians says, he's our peace, we shall be one. He's our reconciliation. This wall is going to be torn down. Let's understand why. Look with me, please, to Hebrews chapter 9. Once again. Verse 8. The Holy Spirit is signifying this, that the way into the holy place has not been disclosed while the outer temple is still standing. Remember, Jesus said, destroy the temple and I'll raise it up in three days? He died for our sins, but in dying for our sins, he broke down this barrier between Jew and Gentile. He was the temple, destroy the temple. The destruction of the physical temple in 70 AD was simply a confirmation that the Messiah had come and died, fulfilling Daniel's prophecy. Although they were here and they knew Jerusalem was going to be ransacked and the temple destroyed, as Jesus and Daniel told them, they weren't worried because God was building a new one in which Gentile would no longer be separated from Jew, in which female would no longer be separated from male. There's only a few of them, but there, there are ultra-Orthodox Jews who will still pray, particularly in the Hasidic sects, thank God I was not born a dog, a Gentile, or a woman. almost an Islamic view of women. Well, Gentile would not be separated from Jew. In this new temple, men would not be separated from women. And in this new temple, the Levites, the clergy, would not be separated from the ordinary people because we'd all be priests. Despite the efforts of Rome and so forth to put a priesthood back, biblically, we're all priests. The clergy are no longer separated from the people, the men from the women, and the Jews no longer separated from the Gentiles. Why? Because the temple's destroyed. When Jesus died on the cross, the temple was destroyed. What happened in 70 AD made it official. It illustrated it. It proved it happened. Now, the reason that Gentile would no longer be separated from Jew, and the reason that men would no longer be separated from women or laymen from clergy is because man would no longer be separated from God. The vilon 
was torn from top to ground. Once man is no longer separated from God, we're no longer separated from each other in Christ. That's Jerusalem. We don't understand what happened in Jerusalem as God's dwelling. We will not understand how God dwells with us. Now let's take this just a little bit further. People ask me, will the temple be rebuilt? I believe yes. Will the Antichrist set up some kind of an abomination in the character of Antiochus? I believe yes, but there's more to it than that. Remember, seven times the New Testament calls the church the temple. When Jesus died, although he physically died and the temple veil was torn from ceiling to ground, a literal event happened in the literal temple. It happened. What was most important is not what happened. What was most important is what it meant. The physical event simply illustrated something spiritual, that we were no longer separated from God because of sin, because the Messiah was the propitiation. The perfect high priest had come and made the perfect atonement. The physical event happened, but it was a picture of something much more important spiritually. Although we may see even in our lifetime a temple rebuilt and an image of the Antichrist in there, although that may happen and I don't deny it, it's a picture of something much more serious and sinister. The church is the temple. The church is the body of Christ repeatedly. I live in Great Britain. The five biggest event, uh, Protestant denominations in England, the Church of England, the Church of Scotland, the Presbyterian Church, the United Reformed Church, and the Methodist Church, all five are ordaining homosexuals and lesbians. In the emergent church, they don't want to go back to the book of Acts. They want to go back to the dark ages. They're literally going back to icons, candles, the Lectio Divina, contemplative prayer, labyrinths, burning incense. They look to medieval monasticism. They go to the dark ages. That's their model of the way things should be. What am I saying? You get in bed with the Pope, he's in bed with the Dalai Lama, as I've said many times before. One month ago was the Manhattan Declaration. In bed with Rome, in bed with the Mormons. The Mormon Jesus is the spirit brother of Satan. It's not our Jesus. The Eucharistic Jesus is not our Jesus. Our Jesus said, if anybody says he came back physically, get away from them. He will come back the way he left via Mount Sair and his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives in Jerusalem and Har Zayatim. If anybody says he came back physically, he said, get away from them. Oh no, he comes back physically in the mass and we worship the bread and wine. The Eucharistic Jesus is not our Jesus. The Mormon Jesus is not our Jesus. The Muslim Jesus is not our Jesus. What am I saying? Yes, keep an eye on Jerusalem, the dwelling place of God. Yes, keep an eye on the Temple Mount. But the abomination of desolation is already being set up in the temple. You understand? The World Council of Churches, the Emergent Church, the Purpose Driven Lie, the Ecumenical Sell Out to Babylon. The abomination is already being set up. When these physical events transpire, they will only be a confirmation of what has happened spiritually. You understand? But ultimately, there's, there's more than that. Jerusalem is always a picture, always a reflection. David Hawking read from Psalm 48, Great is the Lord, greatly to be praised in the city of our God, in the mountain of his holiness, beautiful for elevation. The joy of the whole earth is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Gadol Adonai umeulal meod beir Eloheinu har kodesho yefenov sos ben kola aretz har tzion ir ketet sofana kiriat melakrav. It is a picture of what happens in the heavenlies 
my son Eli, Eli, Eli Ami, born in Galilee, got out of the Israeli army two months ago. He's 23, he's been in two wars. I can't tell you what it's like to have your kid in combat. Some of you know from Iraq or Iran. We have the Calvary pastor here from uh, Albuquerque who knows what it's like. It's not pleasant. Uh, I was watching, I was speaking at a Calvary in California, and I knew the base my son was on was being hit in 2006. I, was, and I had to go out and speak before 3,000, 4,000 people. I was pulling my hair out, what little I had left. That's what happened to it. <laughs> Bad things are going to happen in Jerusalem. Because in the millennial reign of Christ, that is once again where the Lord will dwell in the midst of his people. But that's not the ultimate. I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. I don't know when it's going to be, but we have a Jewish idiom from the Paschal Haggadah. Next year in Jerusalem. Shana haba Yerushalayim. I see these things happening. I'm troubled about what's happening in the church, the temple. I'm troubled about what's happening in Jerusalem. They're trying to divide it, and it will bring God's judgment on anybody who tries to lift that stone. Yes, I am troubled for this country. I'm troubled for the church. I'm troubled for the people of Israel. Two-thirds of them are going to be killed in the Great Tribulation. I am troubled. We're talking about my family now. I'm troubled. Yet despite this, I always look up. Anytime I switch on Fox News or put on the Internet or pick up the Wall Street Journal and I see a bad news report from Jerusalem, I just lift up my head and I say, Shana Haba Be Yerushalayim. God bless.